come on, JP Morgan, can't you stay out of the news for just a little bit? You're in the right place, folks, because this is where the money is. Welcome to the show. I'm Matt Kopenheffer. This is David Hansen. It is Tuesday. Is that right, David? I think so. It is Tuesday. David, the PlayStation 4 is out. Are you are you getting is that on your Christmas list? The PlayStation? No, not on my Christmas list. No. My twelve year old self, definitely on the Christmas list, but I don't have time for PlayStation anymore. Are you getting one? I would I would like to, but I can't. I've had to cut myself off from video games. You're still on the Dreamcast? I, I would I would not be here right now. I would I would lose my job if I had any video game system, so I have no video game That's system. That's fair. Let's get to JP Morgan because we just can't shake him in the headlines. First headline here. First of two J.P. Morgan headlines. J.P. Morgan, U.S. reached historic settlement. This is that $13 billion that we've been talking about. Uh, Haven't we at, seen this headline? Yeah, <laughs> just a few times. Looking at the stock today, the stock was up, uh, last I checked it, more than 1%. 1%. So obviously shareholders or, or investors are not concerned about this. Uh, this I mean, it's a, it's a game of expectations, right? So there's the expectation that J.P. Morgan was going to have this $13 billion settlement. They've set aside for it. Um, and with the, with the holdup, with the, the, the delay of actually setting the settlement, I think there were fears that it would be more than $13 billion. So hearing that it's going to be that $13 billion, I guess, is good news, right? Yeah, and the other point of clarity we got was that they are not going to ask the FDIC to cover any of these dumb, lawsuit losses dumb. there, too, which would kind of be the government charging them out of one pocket and getting charged back. So they're kind of saying, okay, we won't make you pay anything, FDIC. And it would have been nice if they if they got that as a shareholder, but I think this is good just to get this passed and we can move on here. I guess I still think it's all a bit ridiculous given that, again, it's this is coming out of shareholders' pockets. Most of the shareholders of JP Morgan today are not shareholders from before. The the people that were that were responsible for this crisis, let's hold them accountable instead of taking the money out of shareholders' pockets. As much as I've supported Jamie Dimon as a as a banker and as a leader of uh, JP Morgan, I, it's easy for him to settle. It's not his money. Right. Well, he has shares, so maybe a little bit. Yeah, that's that's really going to make or break <laughs> Jamie Dimon. His shares of JP Morgan. All right, go ahead. Second, All right, second second next headline staying with JP Morgan from Bloomberg. Continuing the theme. JP Morgan said to exit Everbright Bank offering amid US probes and this is China Everbright Bank and JP Morgan is supposed to be on uh, an, an IPO here or a sales or a share offering here, but because of the investigation they are now Exiting. So now this is actually an example of these investigations actually hurting business. Now this wasn't a huge offering. I think they were looking to raise two billion dollars, so it wouldn't have been a huge amount of revenue for J.P. Morgan anyway. But this is kind of the reputation, if you can call it reputation, but this is kind of the business impact of these investigations. Are you concerned that this is going to linger on to other things, or you, or no? you pretty much stole my all, all my points <laughs> there? The it is. It's. This starts to get concerning where it gets in the way of business. And just to echo what you said, this isn't a huge offering in itself. But when the regulators and, and these lawsuits start to get in the way of the business, that's when it starts to get worrisome. I'm not worried yet, but if this is a continuing trend, then you start to get concerned. Looking at the silver lining here, it just highlights how impressive their global presence is. I mean, you don't see every bank on a Chinese bank share offering there. I mean, they are still the largest investment bank in the world. There's still going to be a lot of opportunity going forward well, around the globe. On that point, we should probably note then that Morgan Stanley was also on this offering, is still on this offering. There so you go. if you're looking for an alternative of, a, of an investment bank that's getting this business and not, not being concerned over, over bribery allegations mm -hmm. uh, from it, Morgan Stanley. There you go. Third headline. This is from the Financial Times. Bitcoin <coughs> hits $785 with a little help from Bernanke. Woo! Yesterday, <laughs> yesterday, David, we were talking about the Department of Justice and the Securities and Exchange Commission sort of throwing a little bit of support behind uh, digital currencies. And now we've got Ben Bernanke giving, adding to the chorus. Is this, mm -hmm. I, I mean, the, the, the price action, if I, if I can use a trader's phrasing, the price action in Bitcoin has been insane the past few days. Quite insane. That said 785. I think it hit 900 this morning. So this thing is just going crazy. And Bernanke noted that 
we shouldn't just cast this in a light and say, this is all bad, there's no benefits to this. He says we can't stifle innovation, that's what's going to drive the economy forward. And one of the quotes was that Bitcoin could possibly promote a faster, more secure, and more efficient payment system. And when I read that, I thought of Visa and MasterCard. And we talk about these companies as having such a dominant position and nothing can really disrupt them. I'm not saying Bitcoin is going to disrupt Visa and MasterCard, but there's a very, very slight chance that if this would become a legitimate way of paying for things across the globe in a secure and cheap way, it's something that could be on their radar. I don't think they're really losing sleep over it now, but with Visa and MasterCard, I think this is the type of thing that when we're looking for someone to disrupt the market, it could be something like this further down the road. I don't think Bitcoin's there yet with the price going crazy, but if we think 10, 15 years down the road, it's possible. That's all I, I'm saying. I, I think it's an interesting story, and I think it can be a good thing from the perspective of, of that it pushes the rest of the financial services industry to adapt and to improve their systems. But it's called Bitcoin, which makes it sound like a currency. A lot of people mm -hmm. talk about it as a currency. But here's here's an interesting thing to think about. I, I bought, as regular viewers and listeners of the show know, I'm a fan of Domino's Pizza. And I ordered some Domino's Pizza last night. My order was $20. Now, if I had placed that Domino's order at the beginning of the year, or at the end of last year, let's say, and paid for it in Bitcoin, I'd be looking back at a couple pizzas and some chocolate lava cakes that effectively cost $1,163. That's not a good currency. It's good pizza, though. That, it is good pizza. I like the pizza. I'm, I'm going to stand behind that. But a, a good currency does not fluctuate that much, because what ends up happening, uh, that's ma massive, massively deflationary. So, so the, the value of the current, when the value of the currency goes up like that, it's massively deflationary. And the problem that you run into is nobody's going to want to transact. Mm -hmm. Everybody's going to want to hold on to the currency because they're saying, well, at the end of the year, maybe this will be worth 10x what it is now. And why are you going to buy pizza with it? Why are you going to buy a car with it? Why are you going to do anything with it when you can just hold on to it? and hopefully become a, a millionaire. Right, I, I, don't, holding, I don't question that that's the story Bitcoin. today, but... It's pure speculation. It's, it's, it's about the, the greatest example of pure speculation that we could point to in the market. I mean, people want to talk about Tesla as if Tesla is just ridiculous and, and the, price, the price movement th there is crazy. But at least you've got a company that's building and making cars. Um, there may be some speculation going on there, but here with Bitcoin, I think you've got just some really great pure speculation. And I know I can see it in your face that you want to participate. You want to be a I'm part just, of this. I'm just saying <laughs> further down the line, I don't think we can count Bitcoin out as being potentially a, a way to pay for things 20 years down the road. I, I don't think we're even in the first inning here. I don't think we've even sung the national anthem in the game of Bitcoin yet. So I'm, think, I'm just saying it's possible. Probability that you own a Bitcoin by next week. It's possible. All right, moving, <laughs> moving on. All right, moving on to our focus for today. The, it's, it's the season just after, uh, towards the tail end of earnings season, companies uh, and, and financial managers, financial companies are releasing their 13F filings, which disclose their uh, portfolio holdings to the SEC. So these are the, these are the big investments that financial companies have. And of course, we recently got that from Berkshire Hathaway, one of the largest financial companies in the world. Let's cut to the chase here. The big news here, Exxon Mobil now in Berkshire's portfolio. Earlier this year, we had talked about the, the last 13F filing that Berkshire put out, and there was some language in there that essentially said, we bought a whole bunch of something, but because we want to keep buying it, we've got to deal with the SEC that we let them know it's in there, but we're not letting the public know yet. Now we know that something was ExxonMobil. What do you think of this buy? What, what does this say about Buffett? It, it certainly fits the Buffett mold when we look at huge company, huge moat, a lot, lot of cash generated there, a lot of bit buybacks, a lot of dividends for them. So it fits the profile there, and it's their seventh largest holding now. It's at, I think it's around 3.75% of the portfolio. Just behind Walmart, just a little bit ahead of uh, U.S. Bank. Corporate. Right, so it's the... High value. Yep, and it's, the, so it's the, the seventh, and now the top seven stocks in the portfolio now account for 75% of the portfolio's value, even though there's around 43 stocks, I think, in the total portfolio. And we got a nice graphic, a nice little infographic kind of what makes up the biggest part of the portfolio. Obviously, Wells Fargo is still the beast of the mix there. But the listeners uh, listening in, Wells Fargo, 
far and away. We've got Coca-Cola, IBM, American Express. Those are the big four taking up a lot of real estate in this graphic. And then Procter & Gamble, Walmart, and ExxonMobil also up there in a big way as well. Yeah, I mean, I think pretty color. I'm not going not gonna to question Buffett here. I think Exxon is probably a nice ad. It's not expensive uh, on, a, on the face of it. I mean, it, it's a big company, ch ch cheap. He's got the insurance float to, to fund these purchases, so he doesn't need a high-flying growth stock to do well over time. I think it's a fine purchase for the long haul. What do you think? A high-flying growth stock would have would have been a surprise. When the last 13F came out, I did a little speculating of my own. What what could it possibly be that that Buffett has been buying? I mentioned uh, Discover Financial as a possibility because mm -hmm. th there's a little bit of Visa and Mastercard in the Berkshire portfolio. J.P. Morgan, I said, was a possibility. Buffett is is familiar and likes banks, and uh, he's been a big supporter of Jamie Dimon, um, and certainly that stock has been. I, I don't know if we could say beaten up but it hasn't kept kept pace with the market mm -hmm. because of what's been going on. Uh, and then uh, General Mills and Clorox, I thought, were potential uh, uh, big consumer staples companies that he could be looking at. And, and I, I actually, I wrote in the article th that I wrote, I, I said, I'll go on the record saying that when Berkshire does reveal the position, it's likely that my guesses above will probably prove to be wrong. They, of course, were. <laughs> now, what doesn't surprise me about Exxon is that it's a, it's a really strong company it's got a great position. It's a blue chip. Um, I happen to think that that Exxon, along with some of the other oil majors, look undervalued right now. Um, so that, from that perspective, it's not that surprising. From the perspective that it's an oil company, which isn't necessarily Buffett's uh, circle of competence. We talk a lot about how he invests within his circle of competence. You look at that portfolio: heavy in consumer-based companies, heavy in. Um, heavy in financial companies, which, mm -hmm. which Buffett has historically been very focused on. Exxon is kind of outside of that. And what's interesting as well is that he had made a previous bet on uh, Conoco, yep. which didn't work out so well for him. And actually, in this, in this 13F filing, we saw Berkshire selling off Conoco as it bought Exxon Mobil. One big difference that I can see between the two of them is, is Rex Tillerson and the management team at Exxon have been fantastic capital allocators. We talked a little bit about this uh, concept on the show yesterday. They've been fantastic capital allocators over the years. This is something that Buffett does very well and I'm sure respects in other management teams. So I'm sure that, uh, that he saw that in Exxon and, and that was in their favor as well. Yeah, the, the last thing I'll say on the portfolio is we, we always talk about oh, Buffett went out and bought this, Buffett bought that. This isn't just Warren Buffett making the portfolio decisions anymore. We don't have clarity in terms of how, how their process goes and who makes the final decision. It's probably Buffett. It was a $4 but we, billion dollar purchase of ExxonMobil. I'm sure that's, he was in the room. Buffett. That but, is Buffett. But we should we should note that there are other guys. Yes. We got Combs and, no, it's true. It's true. And, and Munger involved too. So we like to say Buffett bought these things, but it really is the Berkshire team that's managing the portfolio. Well, it's, it's, it's a lot of those smaller positions too, like DeVita. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the, some more DeVita stock was added to the portfolio this quarter. That's not Buffett. But Exxon, I, I don't. There's no question in my. That's Buffett. I'm just saying the other guys Exxon. were probably in the room. This and, isn't Buffett just sitting there saying, "I'll take some Exxon." I, I don't know if they even were in the room. I, I'll, I'll give that to you. But one other that we should note, and, and our, our colleague Patrick Morris wrote about this on Fool.com, is that uh, Berkshire also added to its position in uh, U.S. Bank Corp. Mm -hmm. And I don't care what you say, that's Buffett as well. Fair enough. All right, <laughs> moving on to the mailbag. Uh, as always. We love getting emails from our listeners and our viewers. Our email address is WTMI at fool.com. Today's email comes to us about a particular stock. Uh, Mike writes, I've never heard you guys talk about Amtrust Financial. I was wondering what you think of their core business and any other thoughts you might have on the company. David, what's Amtrust Financial? This is an insurance company, a specialty insurance company. This isn't your car insurance. They do workers' comp, some other commercial uh, type insurance there. It's a smaller company. It's around $3 billion. And the ticker there was AFSI, yes. for any, anyone listening. The first thing that jumped out to me about this company was insider ownership. Insiders own around 38% of the company here. And when you first see that, I think a lot of people's reaction is, that's great. That's awesome. That's an automatic check plus for this company. Mm -hmm. But, but you and I were, were doing a little bit more digging, and it may not be that clear. What, what did you find when you were looking at this management team and kind of the big holders of the company? Well, in the, in the proxy statement, 
that, that, that a company issues every year, there's a section called related party transactions. And, and this, is, this is a good section of the, the proxy statement to, for, for investors to check out. Usually it's pretty boring, there's not much there, but sometimes it can be relatively revealing uh, about certain aspects of the company. In this case, there's, there's a fairly big web of different transactions between uh, Amtrust and other companies that are that are controlled and owned by uh, the management team, the, the, the chairman and the, the CEO of Amtrust. There's another publicly traded company called Maiden Holdings, another insurer. Mm -hmm. that there's a lot of transactions going on between Amtrust and Maiden. Um, there's a, a company called, not publicly traded, called American Capital Acquisition Corp. that was uh, a vehicle used to acquire GMAC Insurance Holdings. That's uh, owned, owned primarily or in part by the chairman and, and chief executive of Amtrust. There are a lot of different transactions going on between ACA, ACAC and Amtrust. Uh, there's Am, an Amtrust subsidiary owns a private jet and there are agreements between various other companies uh, associated with Amtrust uh, partly owned by mm -hmm. the management team that take part in this plane, share the, the in the uh, the management team uses this plane for private travel and then reimburses. Um, there are also Amtrust is leasing space from that's owned by the executives of the company. So you've got a lot going on here. That it it, it doesn't you know I, I don't want this to to seem like well that all this is going on. So there's obviously something funny going on right. at Amtrust. Maybe there's not. Um, maybe this is, you know, these leases could be below market. So the, the executives could be giving below mm -hmm. market leases right. to, to the company, and that could be a great thing. But, but I think what this says more, um, more than anything else, and I should also add to that, that the directors at Amtrust are being paid between 181,000, this is total compensation, so cash comp plus shares, between 181,000 and, and more than $300,000. Um, which is, that's rich for directors, particularly to $3 billion company. Mm -hmm. This is not a huge company. And the CEO's total pay package, um, this isn't typical of his pay package, but the CEO's total pay package for 2012 was $18 million. It's a pretty heady uh, package there. So what I would say is that by the numbers, Amtrust looks fantastic. Yeah, the, the, if you look at the combined ratio, it's been under 90% for five years in a row. Exactly. So that, uh, that means that they've been underwriting very mm -hmm. profitably. Uh, the returns on equity are great. The growth has been tremendous. Uh, the top line, the, the revenue has almost doubled since 2011. Um, and, and that's a, part, a big part of that is acquisitions. So that adds to, to my question marks there too, uh, when there are a lot of acquisitions going on and there's a huge amount of growth, particularly in the in the insurance and banking industries, uh, where growth can be had sometimes by getting a little bit more lax in terms mm -hmm. of management. So there are a lot of question marks here. So so again, by the numbers, Amtrust looks great. It looks uh, like a great company. It's been a great like, stock too. Yeah, it mm -hmm. has been a fantastic stock, and it looks like it still could be undervalued if these numbers hold up. But I think for anybody who's looking at Amtrust, maybe interested in learning more about it, it's very important to go through and really get comfortable with the management team, get comfortable with these related party transactions and what's going on there, um, because it doesn't necessarily mean that there's something funny going on, but it, but it could. Mm -hmm. um, so you wanna make sure that you fully understand all I of it. I think a way to do that too would just be get on the last conference call or read the last uh, transcript and see if you can just follow what are they saying? Do I really understand what they're talking about? Does it make sense? Are they communicating this clearly? And maybe that'll clear up some of your unrest. So again, that's a great question from Mike, an interesting company uh, to check out for sure. And keep the questions coming, WTMI at fool.com. Uh, game for today, David, a little bit of would you rather. Love would you rather. Let's, uh, let's get that first scenario up there. It's a Bitcoin kind of day. David, would you <laughs> rather put 10% of your money in Fannie Mae stock or Bitcoin? Easy, Fannie, Fannie Mae stock, and we've talked about- And this uh, is common stock, we're talking about common stock here. For sure, Okay. yeah. I'm definitely going Fannie Mae instead of Bitcoin. All of the government stuff aside, yes, that kind of holds the key to, to the, the castle there for Fannie Mae sh shareholders, whether the government decides to, to give anything back to them because they're really in control of the situation. There are assets underlying, there's businesses that are profitable underlying there. I would be comfortable, more comfortable, uh, taking that risk with the government potentially giving me something rather than Bitcoin, which is just, like we said, a little bit of a speculation play. What do you say? Some of the Fannie and Freddie uh, viewers and listeners 
may be surprised to hear this, but I would go Fannie Mae stock as well. Um, I haven't been particularly kind to the idea of owning, fa owning Fannie Mae common shares, but like you said, there is something legitimate underlying this. One of my big concerns is the uh, probability of a zero outcome there, that the government just winds it down and doesn't give anything back to shareholders. Mm -hmm. But my probability estimates could be off on that, and there's value outside of that. And so I think that there's, there's a, a more legitimate way to figure out the value of Fannie Mae versus what the heck is a Bitcoin worth. Agreed. All right, next scenario. Getting a little more interesting here, not going to make them as easy, is would you rather have $10,000 of Bank of America stock or $20,000 in Bitcoin? So you're getting twice the amount in Bitcoin, but Killing it's me. Bitcoin. So, so what, <laughs> what do you say? Are you taking the 10,000 Bank of America or the 20,000 Bitcoin? Oh, man. Um... I'll go with the twenty thousand Bitcoin. Okay. You, you, you got me. I, I don't. I don't know that I can. That I can really say that I'd rather have half the amount of Bank of America stock. Um, yeah, I, I think I got to go to twenty thousand dollars in Bitcoin. Okay. I, I, I legitimately think. Let me, you let can't me say, sell any of them. Okay. There's let no, let me, like, let me just say. I legitimately. Selling do I have to buy the? Do I have to buy the twenty thousand? No, no. You're no, giving no, me a twenty. Yeah, giving it to you. I legitimately think the Bank of America stock could double. Let's say in the next three to five years. But that would just get it to even uh, unless Bitcoin falls something crazy. I, I'm, I'm going to go with the probability of Bitcoin falling something crazy in the next three to five years is a lot higher than Bank of America. Well, I think Bank of America doubling is a lot higher. You know what I'm saying. Uh, so I you're think, taking the Bank of America? I'm taking the Bank of America stock. I think a double in Bank of America is somewhat likely. I think Bitcoin falling more than 50% is very likely. So I'm taking the Bank of America. I think the head There's an underlying business there that's still going to make a lot of money. All right, let's, let's hit the third one here. Would you rather have $15,000 of Annaly Capital stock or $20,000 in Bitcoins? Still going with the Annaly. Uh, I'm not going with the Bitcoin uh, here. Annaly, it's, it's having a rough time right now, but the management team's been around for over 20 years. They know how to, how to manage capital there. They can manage through cycles. So I'm going with the 15,000. I'm, I'm actually going to go with the Annaly this time. You, you, didn't, you didn't give quite as much of a head start to the Bitcoin on this one. Plus, uh, when we look back at Bank of America, Bank of America isn't paying much of a dividend right now. Annaly, although it's been struggling, is still paying mm -hmm. a, a pretty nice dividend. So on $15,000, I'm taking home some money right now. There you go. And I can spend it, unlike the Bitcoin. There you go. Even better. <laughs> All right, let's finish out on the Twitter sphere. Uh, David, what's our first tweet? Our first tweet is from Max. He says, at TMF Financials, I just bought some Markel in my IRA. Any thoughts? Wait, any thoughts on a dividend in the future? Oh, I hope not. And I actually, I, we, re we responded to Max yesterday saying that, I would say it's unlikely that Markel is going to pay a dividend, but that's not a bad thing in this scenario. You don't always want your companies to pay a dividend because ones that can return a lot of capital internally and to reinvest that money could be better than a dividend. So I would say, I agree with you, probably not looking at a dividend anytime soon in, in the near future at all for Markel, but that's a good thing. Going back to that capital allocation discussion from yesterday, Markel has a lot of different areas that it can put capital to work at good returns. Tom Gaynor, really smart guy. I like it. Maybe a dividend in Bitcoin? I don't think that's good. <laughs> Let's see the second tweet. <laughs> this is from David Marcus. His uh, Twitter handle is at David Marcus. said, do what I did, connect your PayPal account with Uber and get $15 off your next ride. Seamless. So this is a, a new partnership between PayPal and Uber. PayPal, obviously a part of eBay, Uber, private company. But when we had Morgan Housel on the show a couple weeks ago, he said, I said, if there's one private company that you would want to invest in right now. Oh, that's a good one. He said it would be Uber. Oh, yeah, that's um, a really good one. I think this is a great partnership for PayPal as they move away from just those traditional online purchases into more mobile transactions with other merchants like an Uber. I think this is a win-win for both companies and I'm fairly bullish on the future of both. So of it's a win for me too because I hadn't seen this before and now I know that I can get that 15% mm -hmm. discount. Love Uber. Love and hate Uber. Uber has ruined taxis <laughs> for me. Every time I'm in a taxi now, I feel like I'm in public transportation because Uber is so nice. Ah, <sighs> sigh. All right. <laughs> Finish this off, David. What's the Final last tweet, tweet of the day? This is from Bill Krebs. He says, at Cope the Fool, that is Matt Cope and ever seen next to me. He says, is, lose the bow tie. You're not Jim Rogers. That is a fact. 
And we have a picture. There's the comparison between Jim Rogers and Matt Kopenheffer. They do look somewhat similar. I think that could <laughs> be like not, an old version of you. We do not look anything. Um, well, maybe. Are you trying to be Jim Rogers? I am not trying to be Jim Rogers. <laughs> I can't believe you did. I am not trying to be Jim Rogers. I am not Jim Rogers. That is a fact. He got that totally right. I am not Jim Rogers. Um, however, I will point out I've got a great new bow tie today. This is from Bow Tie Cause. This is a bow tie designed in part by Terrell Owens. It's got little uh, neurons in here. This is to support Alzheimer's research. Mm -hmm. And as I've mentioned on the show before, I am growing my terrible beard for November uh, as a way to, to try to, uh, I, I don't know, guilt people or, or make people laugh into uh, supporting Alzheimer's research mm -hmm. for the Alzheimer, uh, the Alzheimer Fund, the Cure Alzheimer Fund, I should say, and that's curealc.org. Um, but anyway, I'm going to keep wearing them. I, I, I appreciate the tweet. Yeah, for sure. Bow ties, bow ties. Bring on more Terrell Owens bow ties. I'd love to see uh, more of them. Yeah, I'd like to see some more Terrell Bowens bow ties. Some more Terrell <laughs> Owens bow ties. There's a brand. If I can get it. Terrell Bowens. <laughs> <laughs> a new collection of bow ties. All right. Uh, readers, uh, viewers, and listeners can tweet at us at TMF Financials. And again, our email address is WTMI at fool.com. That is our show for today. I am Matt Copenheffer, not Jim Rogers. This is David Hansen, also not Jim Rogers. Thanks for watching. We'll see you tomorrow. People on the show may have interest in the stocks they talk about, and The Motley Fool may have formal recommendations for or against. Don't buy or sell stocks based solely on what you hear.